Hello, welcome to episode 123 of the Cricket Her Weekly. Those of you who are familiar with a certain city may recognise our backdrop. Where are we, Sid? And why are we here? We're in the centre of Birmingham. We've been here for the Commonwealth Games. Um, we've seen all the games so far and we're looking forward to more games tomorrow. We've had a bit of a rest day today. Um, it wasn't quite so restful for Raf because unfortunately we went out running this morning and uh, she slipped over and ended up in the minor injury clinic. So Thanks for telling everybody that. <laughs> I'm absolutely fine, but just in case you do spot any bandages, that's what's going on. Thanks, Sid. <laughs> okay. Hashtag not a cricketer. <laughs> um, so we are going to talk about what we've seen at the Commonwealth Games in a minute. Uh, but first of all, there was some actually quite big news that came in last night. So it's probably a good thing we didn't record our podcast the usual time yesterday because we would have missed this very big news, sudden news. Deandra Dottin has announced her retirement from international cricket. Um, but there was an interesting date on the post, wasn't there, Sid? Yeah, so it looks like you know she'd, she'd kind of written a post and written a letter um, like a month ago and then it, it waited a month and it's only been released on the 1st of August rather than the 1st of July when it was actually written. So the kind of implication there, I mean, we're, read, we're reading things into this. We don't have any in, inside information. We don't really know any of the West Indies players well at all. Um, but the implication is that she must have handed them some kind of ultimatum on the 1st of last month and said, you know, there's a month... If, if we can't sort out something within a month, then I'm going to you know, announce my retirement. And she announced it. Um, there's a bit of an implication in there that, that there are potentially some issues with the management. Mm. Um, she's obviously not entirely happy with the, the, the team culture and something like that. Yeah. But, I mean, who knows what that means. It's, it's, it's all very opaque. I'm sure that um, you know, West Indies are playing, again, uh, one more game this week. Uh, or, sorry, Barbados, of course, are playing, playing one more game this week. Dottin's playing in that. I'm sure that there will be a 1,000 people heading into the scrum that is the mix zone uh, at the cricket uh, media centre. Well, let's talk about that in a minute. <laughs> in order to try and find out what's going on. And I guess we'll be with them, Raf. We'll, we'll be kind of asking those questions. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and you're right to emphasise that it's Barbados, not West Indies, who are currently playing in the Commonwealth Games, because she will, of course, finish up this tournament. Um, and then after that, she said that she's going to carry on playing in the T20 franchise leagues that are around the world. Well, not just the T20 ones, because obviously we've got the 100 as well. That's going to be a big part of her pay packet from now on. Um, and there's also been quite a bit of talk that suggests that that's a little bit worrying, because it follows hot on the heels of Lizelle Lee, who's obviously doing similar and has decided that it's more financially lucrative for her to um, give up her contract with Cricket South Africa um, in order to ensure that she can have that money coming in from competitions like the 100. Um, is, a bit, is it a bit of a concerning trend, Sid? What do we think about this? Well, it's interesting that Charlotte Edwards posted something onto Twitter this morning as basically as soon as she heard the news going, something must be done about this. Um, but it's a bit difficult to know what you do about it, really, yeah. because, you know, obviously there are issues that the players aren't being paid huge amounts of money by the board. Um, Lizelle Lee uh, told Ali Mitchell in her stumped podcast for the BBC um, that her base base of South Africa was kind of similar to what she gets from the 100. And of course, she'll get more from playing in other leagues like the, the WBBL, where she's just signed to play for the Hobart Hurricanes, go Hurricanes. Um, and, and, you know, so obviously the, 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 it represents an opportunity for them in the short term to make more money. I think the other concern for the players, though, isn't it, Raf, that, you know, how long can a player kind of sustain themselves by just playing these T20 leagues? You know, the, obviously the, there are, are some superstar players in the men's game that are able to do it, but actually it's not really very many of them. It's the really major superstars that are able to kind of play on their reputation and to be able to continue getting those those contracts how long will some of these players be able to continue getting contracts if they're not doing you know regular fitness training and there are other there are financial issues you looked a bit into this this morning didn't you some of the financial issues that these players are going to face because of course they're even if you get a thirty thousand pound contract with the hundred you don't walk away with thirty thousand pounds do you raf well no um Obviously, I think that potentially um, some of these players have underestimated um, the costs of things that normally get paid for by the cricket board, as I understand it. So if you want to maintain your standards so that you get selected and you get recontracted in these competitions, there are all kinds of costs that come with that. Lizelle Lee certainly um, strongly suggested on that Stumped podcast that one of the things that she was concerned about was not being able to afford her flight from South Africa to England to play in the 100. So that suggests 
that overseas players are paying their own travel costs um, to and from their home country to England. Um, and potentially that's also the case if you're flying out to Australia for the WBBL. Well, those, those flights don't come cheap, um, even if you are just going um, you know, normal, ordinary, um, standard class. Um, so, yeah, there's that to think about. There's, there's access to gym equipment. There's access to private coaching. Um, you won't, obviously won't have any access to the international coaches anymore, so you're going to have to go out and fund your own private personal coaches. So these are all factors that, um, you know, have to be... These are all things that have to be factored in when you're doing those calculations. And, of course, as well, it's a very uncertain existence. Rachel Priest tried to do it a few years ago, and admittedly that was before the 100 competition. Um, and we know that the 100, you know, the fees in the 100, if you're on a top contract, are quite good. Um, so perhaps Rachel Priest was, you know, trying to be a pioneer before her time. Um, but she actually eventually went back and got a contract with New Zealand again because it was so hard for her to make a living. Um, and if you are Dotton, if you are Lee, it really put so much pressure on you to perform at the top of your game in those competitions otherwise who knows whether the 100 will come and offer you a £30,000 contract next year perhaps they'll want to bump you down to a £20,000 one or a £15,000 one or even you know we know that the lowest contracts are like you know 5000 or something and that for that for somebody like um, like Lizelle Lee is not even going to co cover her costs to come to England probably um, so it's it's a it's a very stressful existence that they're putting on themselves yeah and if you're if, if you're a sort of mercenary T20 cricketer don't get injured as well yeah um, because yeah. you know the y you won't you won't get paid by the league if you get injured you can privately insure against injury you can insure your income just like any in any of the rest of us can um, but if you're earning a lot of money and you're a professional athlete that's that insurance comes expensive um, if you're English a particular situation is that you need uh, essentially to maintain uh, private medical insurance so um, you know if any of the England players are thinking I could do this what they need to bear in mind is that they would lose their access potentially to the to the private medical insurance paid by their current employer and they'd have to fund their own private medical insurance now private medical insurance for ordinary people in this country costs you know like a hundred pounds a month private medical insurance for a professional athlete w will be considerably more than that and although we have a national health service in this country which we're very grateful for yes. um, you know if it does mean that if you trip over when you're running along by the canal, you wait for three hours to be seen. Yeah, and if you, you know, if you pull a muscle or whatever, you're, you're going to get, a, unfortunately, a different level of treatment. You know, and if you need long-term surgery, you know, that's just, you go on a waiting list and, you know, you might be lucky to get it in three or four years along with everybody else. So the point is that there are huge risks associated with this, this career leap, but it's going to be really interesting to see how these people do. And, you know, obviously, you know, the positive thing for fans is that we'll carry on getting to see them play in these leagues. Um, but it is an interesting question how long the players will be able to, you know, maintain themselves when the, there's still not huge, huge amounts of money in women's cricket. This is very different to Chris Gale doing it for a million pounds a year. This is people doing it for sort of 20 or 30,000 pounds a year. So yeah, we'll see. And I like to think that we're very much on the side of the players, um, even if perhaps that sometimes doesn't come across. But I hope I am on the side of the players. So, you know, if this gives players a different career route um, and access to, you know, to a longer career than they may otherwise have had with the cricket board, then I think we have to welcome it. Um, but I just, I'm just concerned that perhaps the implications haven't been thought through. And I think maybe we're not quite at the moment that people think that we've arrived at in terms of being able to do that. Perhaps in five years' time, if the salaries in the hundred have increased enormously, um, then we're going to be at a different point. But I'm not convinced that we're quite at that point yet. Well, good luck to the Pioneers and good luck to Deandra Dossin, who of course will be playing in matches coming up. Now, what have we got coming up, Raf? We've got Barbados and the Barbados is going to be playing India in a virtual quarterfinal, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so let's just run through what's happened in the Commonwealth Games so far. There's been so much cricket, it's actually difficult to remember sometimes. Well, um, I think we can safely remember that Australia have won um, both of their opening matches um, and so they are safely sitting top of Group A. And um, definitely, qualified, yeah. definitely qualified for the, quarter, so the semi-finals. Right. Yeah. Pakistan um, have lost both of their opening two games, um, so they are not definitely quite... Definitely not qualified. Not 
No, they quite, are, they are not quite out, out of it. No, oh, they, they are, are out, out yeah. right? Thank you, thank you, Sid, man behind the maths. <laughs> um, and we did have a um, there was great. There was a Canadian journalist who was sent to cover the cricket the other day at the Commonwealth Games. I've poor, never watched poor guy. a he knew never it, he watched knew a game of cricket. Never watched. What's going on? Uh, that was a bit Yankee, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> And so Sid had to go and explain to him all the permutations of who might be out and who might be in and everything like that. So well done. Um, anyway, um, so yes, as you say, Barbados v India coming up. That is a virtual quarterfinal, so that's going to be quite an exciting one. We, we would expect, we would predict that India would finish on top. But I've been actually really interested to see the way in which Barbados have been playing. Um, you've got a kind of new captain who is going to be the captain of the West Indies, but this is her first opportunity to captain international cricket, Hayley Matthews. And they did have a bad loss to Australia yesterday. Um, however, I was impressed by the way that um, Hayley Matthews managed to kind of keep spirits up in the field and really kind of keep that chat out there going. And it was such a marked contrast to what we sometimes see um, or have seen of late um, with the West Indies. When they're down, they're really, um, they're really very down in the field. Um, and it does feel like um, you know, they just kind of resign themselves to defeat and they just stop talking to each other. They stop celebrating wickets. They stop everything like that. Um, and you know, particularly in that dismal series in amidst the pandemic in September 2020 where they just lost all of those T20s back to back and every time they just went totally into their shells. It didn't feel to me like Barbados have been doing that actually. Yeah, Hayley Matthews has been very much leading from the front. I mean, what an athlete. She's, she's yeah. like the most the most gifted natural athlete in the women's game, you know, just in terms of like her ability to throw herself around, her ability to kind of execute moves on the field and things. And of course, you know, a great batter and somebody that's, that is in a position to very much lead from the front mm -hmm. and she's been doing that and she is, she's been and keeping team spirits up been clapping the girls and you know ensuring that they maintain that positive attitude and that's what she was talking about in the in the mix zone afterwards maintaining that positive attitude so I think that could be some good news for West Indies going forwards as well that they're, yep. they're going to have a, a very different approach to that captaincy a much more like proactive mm -hmm. approach yeah absolutely um, and the other thing that was interesting about yesterday's game um, was that even though Australia were pretty dominant, uh, Meg Lanning very unfortunately dropped a catch at slip um, that would have given Alana King a hat trick. And it was very and much and the Pfeiffer and the Pfeiffer. Ah. She dropped the hat trick and the Pfeiffer. Okay, um, it was it was it was all a bit awkward. And then um, it was quite funny because the um, Australian media officer brought um, Meg Lanning, who had this brilliant innings with the bat, and Alana King, who'd bowled brilliantly, um, both into the mix zone. Um, and so we were interviewing, <laughs> we were interviewing Alana King first. We go, so what did what did you say to Meg after she dropped the hat trick catch? And uh, meanwhile, Meg Lanning Meg's in the background, in the background going. Um, and yeah, so um, you know, it ha and, and Alana King was brilliant. She just said it happens. It's cricket. And then we swapped them around, and Meg Lanning came up. Um, and she she just she just made a joke. She's like, "Can you ask me something original for the first question?" So I was like, "Oh, what do you think about the fact that 150,000 tickets have been sold for the Commonwealth Games?" And she went into like proper um, PR mode and was like, "Oh, it's brilliant. Women's cricket growing." And then I went, "Are you going to have a? Are you are you going to um, have nightmares tonight?" And she went, "Yes, <laughs> yes, I am." Um, and then she said, "Yes, I'm going to have nightmares, and I want I wanted to dig myself a hole and and for the ground to swallow with me up, basically." And actually. You know, it was. Um, we often talk about Meg Lanning as just being quite clinical in interviews because that's the gig, and it was really nice to see a more human side to her, and really nice for her to actually, you know, she's not perfect, nobody's perfect, and she gets it wrong sometimes, and that's just cricket, as as they both said. Um, and you know that she's going to be feeling really bad today, um, and potentially for a little while. Um, but those things happen, don't they? Um, so that was that was quite an enjoyable moment in the mix zone. Yeah, I do wonder if what, what we're going to see going forward is perhaps a little bit of a different side to Meg Lanning. I mean, the people that that know her well, and we don't know her well because she's never got mm. she's never gotten she's never allowed people like us to get close to her. That she's not interested in playing that game. Um, but I wonder whether we're going to see a more relaxed Meg Lanning now that she's got kind of the monkey off her back about the World Cup. You know, I think that always nagging at the back of her mind would have been the fact that you know she hasn't won a World Cup. It's the, it's the Lionel Messi question if you like. You know, Can you call yourself the greatest player if you've never won a World Cup? But now she has won that World Cup, she's done it. Can she kind of relax and you know go okay well now everything else is just bonus because I've won the World Cup, I've proved that I'm one of the all-time greats. I think you're being very premature there. I think give it seven days time and see if she wins a gold at the Commonwealth Games um, and then perhaps we'll be will be walking down that road but as far as she's concerned she's got that gold in her sights and Australia are not going to give it up without a fight.
Talking of which, shall we talk about the other side of the draw, which is the side in which um, England have been placed, Group B. Um, so England um, have, um, have been successful so far. Um, they've played two matches. No, one they match. played one match, sorry, against Sri Lanka um, and they won that um, with some degree of ease, although not a total degree of ease, shall it we say. It wasn't quite as easy as the scorecard yeah. made it look, was it? The scorecard says they won with, what, 17 balls to spare, um, you know, and Alice Capsey got 40-something top scored, but... <laughs> It, there was some slight nervousness <laughs> as we were, we were getting to the to the heart of it. You know, Alice Capsey got out right at the end. I think she was kicking herself. I mean, I don't think she was. I don't. People have said that she was trying to uh, whack it for six, but I really don't think she was. She was trying to clip it through mid wicket. Um, so she was playing a sensible shot, but you know, it didn't work out. Went straight through her, and you know, <laughs> bye bye Al. But you know, she still she still did the job. But I guess that she wasn't happy after it, and yeah. I think that England weren't weren't entirely happy either. You know, they 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 talked a good game afterwards, but I think they're obviously going to need to play much better than that in the games to come if they're going to want to win that gold medal, and especially given how dominant Australia have looked because that that Australian performance against India in particular when they were 50 odd for five and you were like you know they they're gonna they're gonna sweep the board here. India are going to sweep the board and 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 you know upset all the deck chairs and, and throw the cat amongst the pigeons and all that stuff. All those metaphors were ready to come out from the journalists' keyboards. Uh, but Grace Harris, uh, you know, was able to, with Ashley Gardner, just, yeah. you know, get them back into it. And it just shows, you know, the, the class going down. And Grace Harris, you know, she hasn't even been a regular for Australia. And yet she, she, she's brought in and, you know, she can pull off that, you know. If England had been in that situation, you know, it, you feel it would have been curtains, right? But yeah, well... I don't know though because actually I was really impressed with the way that Alice Capsey and Maya Boucher batted um, and they haven't been regulars for England because they're too young. Um, so actually it was kind of nice to see two youngsters taking it home for England and all that they did was just calm things right down, slowed things right down, but not in a kind of, not in a, oh goodness, we're, we're worrying about the run rate, but just in a, let's get, our, um, let's get our calm heads on and let's be mature about this. And that's one thing that I've always said about Alice Capsey is yes, she's only 17, a year ago she was only 16, the year before that when I started raving about her she was only 15, but you always felt... The year felt before that as well, this is, this is interesting Raph, the year before that she was only 14. Shut up. Um, you always felt that she was mature, didn't you? Um, and that Absolutely. she could ha you, that she could handle those kind of pressure situations. Um, and to do it despite having been hitting the ball right before um, right before play in the warm up was was particularly impressive. Um, I think you said that England talked a good game in the in the post match. Actually, Nat Siver was was reasonably honest, and she said, "Well." Um, or was it Kat Catherine Brunt said actually we were quite nervous um, and we've been nervous for World Cups and obviously Catherine Brunt's played in a million World Cups and a million pressure situations but she just said this was something different this is the Commonwealth Games it felt different you know I had a different kind of butterflies um, and actually the first few overs of of that game it was all about just trying to overcome that feeling um, and almost you know just keep playing um, regardless of that feeling um, and to, to sort of work their way through that. So hopefully in the next game, we'll see a slightly calmer England. Um, but um, England are top of Group B in, in um, first place jointly with New Zealand, um, who have also been successful. Uh, we'd probably say that at this point, they're both likely to qualify for the semi-finals. Yeah, New Zealand looks impressive against South Africa, didn't they? Susie Bates got, you know, one of, one of the biggest scores of her long, long career. I put a nice graph up on Twitter showing it was, you know, she was into the 90s for only the third time in her T20 career. Obviously, that's that's quite unusual to get that far in a T20 innings. So that was great. Sophie Devine looks in good form. You know, could it could New Zealand wind up nicking one? At, you know, at the, right at the end of these people's careers. You know, if they, if those two can perform well, it could happen for them. And you know, no one will be more pleased for them than we would, right? Yeah, love Susie Bates, love Sophie Devine. They were both brilliant fun in the mix zone. Um, we've got a question that came in, though, just in relating to um, England's uh, next couple of matches, um, or next match in particular. Uh, Dan Taylor says, head scratcher for you. Assuming Heather Knight gets fit, because she did obviously miss that first fixture against Sri Lanka with the hip injury. Assuming she gets fit, who does she replace? I wonder if they might replace a bowler instead. What are your thoughts? He adds, such a nice, such a strong squad. It's a nice problem to have. Um, so, what are England going to do? Their next match is against South Africa tomorrow, Sid. Yeah, it is definitely a challenging one. You don't know who to drop, do you? Um, 
in some ways the obvious player to drop is actually Danny Wyatt not because she's done anything wrong but because you know she's probably the next one on the list if you want to bring back Heather because you don't want to drop Maya Boucher you don't want to drop Alice Capsey you know you don't you certainly don't want to drop Nat Siver you can't drop Amy Jones if you're bringing Heather back then that means that Danny Wyatt is potentially at risk um, at that point, though, you go, well, who's going to open the batting? Does Heather Knight come up and open the batting? Well, if she's you know, coming back from this injury and if she's suffering some pain, which we understand that she is going to be suffering some pain ongoing probably from this, then you know that's potentially a challenge for her. Do you move Alice Capsey? I mean, Alice Capsey effectively opened the batting in one of the T20s because, of course, she was in from the second ball because Sophia Dunkley got golden duck. Um, so you could move Alice Capsey up to open the batting. But it's going to be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, I mean, when you said, oh, there's an obvious person to drop, I thought you were going to say Amy Jones, who has had quite a difficult run of form um, in, in T20 cricket. Um, but obviously, they can't do that because they don't have anyone else to keep wicket, other than Heather, who's done it for about five minutes in one of the fair break matches, which I'm a little bit sceptical that that would actually translate <laughs> into the Commonwealth Games situation that we're in. But Indeed. yeah, it is a dilemma for England. Yeah, no, and they've just got, you know, it's kind of the, almost the opposite of New Zealand. New Zealand have got, you know, a few players that, that uh, they're utterly dependent on. England are now have got this dilemma almost more like Australia, as of like, who don't we play? So, nice problem to have, guys. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in to this week's episode. Sorry it was brought to you a little bit late. I've no idea what day or when we're going to find, find time to, to film the next episode because we've got some quite intense few days of cricket coming up. Um, it will be the, both the bronze medal and the gold medal match on the same day on Sunday when we usually record. So let's just see, Sid. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye.